Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michael McNutt, Director of Education and Events with Weedy, and welcome to Weedy's virtual spotlight series, Standards Updates with HL7. It's my pleasure to introduce Robert Tennant, Vice President of Federal Affairs with Weedy. Let me uh, add my welcome uh, to all who have joined us today. This is the third of a four part series highlighting uh, standards development organizations and uh, timing couldn't be better for this one. We've got uh, an exciting program today. We have uh, uh, gonna be talking about um, HL7 and the work of Da Vinci. And uh, I just wanted to start by giving you an overview of Weedy, who, who we are and uh, why we're involved in all of this. Um, and really we go back to the first Bush administration where uh, a practicing physician, uh, Dr. Lewis Sul Sullivan was uh, secretary of health and human services. And as a practicing physician, he knew firsthand the challenges that faced providers and health plans exchanging administrative data. So um, he called on industry leaders to come up with solutions, including moving away from manual processes to electronic, um, moving to a more automated solution and creating a, a framework of privacy and security to make sure that patient information was kept secure. Uh, that led to the development of, of two reports from what then was called the Working Group for Electronic Data Interchange. And that uh, those two reports were folded into legislative language, which made its way into uh, uh, what's known as a unicorn these days, a bipartisan healthcare bill, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And HIPAA was actually named in the law as an advisor uh, to HHS. And we performed that role um, uh, for many years, uh, we have uh, very close relationships with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, for the Office uh, uh, for Civil Rights, and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. So how do we do our work? Well, one word is co consensus. Uh, our, our, our goal is to really help bring the industry together to identify challenges in data e exchange and and other health IT issues um, and come up with solutions. Um, and how we do that? Well, we have many work groups and sub work groups. Um, we have task groups, we have open public forums. We're gonna have one of those we'll talk about uh, later um, next month um, and uh, conferences and virtual spotlights like, like the one we have today. We also have policy advisory groups, um, but really our sweet spot is our work groups, our, our, our volunteer efforts. And you can see here, we have everything from payment models to acknowledgements to dental claims, uh, genomics. Uh, we've got a, a new one on the No Surprises Act, which is very important in terms of uh, some of the challenges presented to the industry. And it's there where we bring stakeholders together again to talk, uh, to challenge each other, and to come up with uh, solutions. Uh, we have a link here, uh, but you can go to the, the work group community home, homepage. We have Samantha Holvey on the line here. Uh, she is responsible for all our work groups. So reach out to her. Um, I will remind folks that if you uh, are a member of Weedy, every one of your employees is also a member. So you may be interested yourself in, in claims, but you may have a colleague that is interested in, in privacy and security. So everybody in your organization can get involved. So again, you know, when I think about Weedy, I think about bringing folks to, together. You know, if there's one word that describes Weedy, it's convener. And what we try to do is, is create a, a platform where a kind of a safe space where folks can come and talk and come up with solutions. And the nice thing is we have um, such uh, a great history that the uh, government is very interested in hearing what Weedy has to say because we're able to bring these uh, very diverse stakeholders together and arrive at uh, solutions. And again, want to learn more about us, uh, www.weedy.org. And with that, um, 
again, what we want to do is uh, talk about um, these new opportunities to move the industry forward. So in particular, we are going to be looking at the, the X12 uh, proposed standards and the proposed updated and new operating rules from CQH. November 9th from 12 to 4 will be the opportunity to, to discuss these. These have been proposed to the National Committee for Vital and Health Statistics. And so it's an opportunity for you to weigh in on these proposals. We'll also be talking about some general implementation issues like compliance dates and should certain stakeholder groups go first uh, before others. So don't miss that. It's free for WEDI members. And it, again, gives us an opportunity to weigh in on these issues directly to the National Committee on Violent Health Statistics and to CMS directly. Um, this is uh, being recorded. Um, and the way that we interact, the way that you have an opportunity to ask uh, questions is directly through the chat. So take advantage of this. This is a unique opportunity to hear from the leading expert on these standards. So take advantage of that, ask your questions, raise issues. Um, and again, uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, get a copy of this uh, sent to you. So if you uh, have colleagues that want to uh, listen to the conversation, you'll be able to share that. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Viet Nguyen. He is uh, renowned as an expert in standards uh, he has been a longtime friend uh, of, of Weedy. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Nguyen, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, just do a quick mic check that you can hear me okay? You sound great. Great. So uh, thank you uh, again, Rob, for the uh, opportunity, and thank you to Weedy for the opportunity to uh, present an update to the uh, Weedy community on HL7, as well as uh, the Da Vinci Project. Uh, many of you know I wear a number of hats and, and the first part of this presentation, I'll be wearing my hat as the Chief Standards Implementation Officer and telling you a little bit about some of our uh, plans uh, for HL7 in the upcoming years. And then uh, I'll switch hats and uh, give you a Da Vinci update. And uh, hopefully through this, feel free to uh, enter your questions and comments in the chat and I'll try to address them along the way. And if we have some time at the end, uh, we'll address uh, uh, more of them. So briefly, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with HL7, uh, HL7 International is a not-for-profit formed in 1987. We're an ANSI accredited standards development uh, organization. And our goal is to uh, develop a comprehensive network and framework of standards for exchanging, integrating uh, electronic health information. Uh, you're probably already familiar with our uh, version two standards that are uh, implemented extensively, as well as our version three represented by the clinical document architecture that is, is also uh, widely implemented. And of course, the, the newest of our standards, FHIR, which is now 11 years old, um, we'll be spending the most of our time uh, discussing. Really, HL7 is a global uh, community and organization with representation of over 50 countries, over 500 corporate members, 1,600 in individual members, and thousands and thousands of contributors, uh, both in the standards work as well as the implementation work. And we're continuing uh, to grow and uh, foster these communities to uh, utilize our standards. I wanted to introduce this for those of you who've seen my presentations before this, the FHIR timeline to give you a little context on where we are today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, FHIR is now uh, 11 years old, um, brought about from the HL7 Fresh Look Task Force and really driven by a recognition of the need for uh, open standards and the um, implementation of APIs or application programming interfaces across the technology and internet uh, industries. And over the course of the uh, past 10 years, we've matured tremendously with adoption of uh, FHIR standards by uh, major vendors, as well as the development of um, FHIR accelerators that have brought communities together to utilize FHIR to improve the interoperability of, of the exchanges in their communities. And this has also been driven by some of the regulatory activities that have 
now really put uh, fire standards and implementation not only in the provider domain, but with the CMS uh, patient access API now uh, payers also have uh, fire capabilities. And what I wanna highlight is the right-hand side of this um, timeline is the December of this year's um, deadline for compliance around the Cures Act. And why this is important is uh, with the uh, saying that um, Wayne Gretzky would like to say, you always skate to the puck. The puck is headed uh, to December of this year where health IT certified vendors, including EHR vendors, uh, will have fire capability uh, uh, as well as US core uh, profiles and standards and smart on fire capabilities what this will allow us to do is really to make this quantum leap in our ability to leverage uh, clinical data um, for exchange and improvement of patient care and administrative processes. So with this recognition of this rapid maturation of, of fire and with the initial emergence of the um, COVID epidemic, the HL7 board and leadership uh, really began a process to um, re-envision how we would come out of the pandemic and be able to expand the support that we can provide to the healthcare industry with our standards. And from that, uh, the re-envisioning effort identified five areas of core principles um, of focus, agility, global relevance, community, and sustainability that would form the principles by which we would uh, plan our future for HL7. And from that, we brought together leaders and members of the HL7 community to take those principles and develop a plan around them. So the re-envisioning efforts had a number of task forces that looked at these five areas and um, recommended activities for us to uh, kind of modernize and be able to support the community uh, going forward. And from these, we developed a set of strategies. And with these strategies, we have uh, developed a three-year plan as well as a budget that we have uh, shared with the community and we'll be having some HL7 webinars about as well. But really they're focused on how do we expand on work that we already do, but expand it to the uh, implementer community, improve on our education, develop uh, improved and extensive platforms for testing, um, grow our community of uh, subject matter experts as well as communities of practice, and then also, of course, support our own uh, membership in doing the, the challenging and important work of standards development. Um, and so I wanna highlight one of these areas because next week at the in-person meeting in Washington, uh, Dr. Chuck Jaffe, our CEO, and I will be highlighting some of these uh, broader programs that we have so that uh, you all can be more familiar with what we can do and, and how you might be able to participate. So I hope we'll be able to see you in uh, Washington, DC next week. But I want to highlight this, um, this first strategy around the fire accelerators. And uh, as many of you know, we have had the fire accelerator program now for about five years. And the goal is really to support the implementer community in looking at their needs and their opportunities in interoperability and bringing them together to identify those priorities and work on those priorities by developing fire implementation guides as well as becoming a ready community of implementers to adopt those guides. We are now uh, up to eight fire accelerators with discussions uh, with others communities who are interested in uh, developing their own accelerators. The ones uh, that you see on the screen range from patient engagement to oncology to uh, social determinants, research and public health. And the fire accelerator program recognizes that the standards development process, creating the standards is really just the first few miles of a very long journey and that the implementer community um, is an important uh, stakeholder in both the standards development so that we can develop standards that they can implement. But the vast majority of implementers aren't engaged in standard development, but need to pick up these standards. And so uh, the goal of the Fire Accelerator program is really to bring the implementers as more into the standards development process and then be able to take those artifacts that we have developed and support the implementer community in adopting these standards. And as part of the uh, re-envisioning 
uh, work was the uh, recognition and creation of the role that I'm in now and the uh, standards implementation division to work hand in hand with our standards development uh, activities and uh, division in uh, both developing the standards and supporting the community in implementation. Because this little diagram here is really the HL7 narrow part of it, but the, the majority of this work is actually taking it to the market and taking this, um, the, our standards and growing them uh, and helping the industry adopt them. So as part of that, we recognize that we have a number of communities very interested in creating their own fire accelerators. So you may hear accelerators used as a, a common noun, but in this case, I'm gonna use it as a proper noun. And the goal here with the accelerator blueprint program is to help these communities of practice to develop a concept around an accelerator, to provide them with best practices and artifacts to help them with that development, and then giving them the framework by which they can operationalize, uh, govern and grow an accelerator project so that they can focus on their subject matter expertise and the work of their community, as opposed to having to focus on how to develop a governance process or how to engage in uh, standards work. Well, we recognize that the popularity of developing fire implementation guides also um, means that there's oversight and governance that uh, the HL7 process and the community has to engage in as well. And so we want to use this blueprint to help the communities of practice to engage in HL7 more efficiently so that um, we can get high quality standards developed and, and uh, uh, implemented and published uh, without causing uh, undue burden on the overall process of, of standards development. And we really look to have the Accelerator Blueprint program be a global program that could be adopted by uh, communities in, in other realms. But the key is to bring the communities together first to identify a need and a, um, a desire to do this work. And once they can do that, we can engage them in the uh, accelerator program and help them um, to create an accelerator. And of course, um, this is where I, I switch hats to uh, the accelerator that I, I spend a fair amount of time with in the DaVinci project. And for those uh, not familiar with DaVinci, we are a, a provider, payer, vendor-led collaborative. We have over 50 members now, uh, ranging from different parts of the community, as well as industry partners like HIMSS and, and NCQA that have identified a number of areas where uh, we have developed implementation guides in order to improve on the sharing of clinical and administrative data to both improve care as well as to uh, improve uh, efficiency in information exchange. Uh, this diagram uh, has evolved over the years and where we are now is if you look at the diagram, we have a dial and we have colors to the dial. And what we uh, did with this diagram was to address a question we often get asked by the community, which is, you have a lot of guides, where do I start? And so the color coding and the dials will um, give you a sense of how mature the guide itself is in terms of how much it's been tested and matured, as well as uh, how well adopted it has been in the industry. Of course, you can see certain of these guides have uh, were named in uh, federal regulations, so they're widely implemented. But also, uh, we have some notation to help understand where some of these guides may either relate to existing regulations or uh, may support uh, uh, future uh, policy recommendations. So uh, I'm going to dive into some of these guides to highlight uh, guides that are uh, important to this uh, WEDI community. So, um, so just to give you a little bit of context, we've uh, continued to be really busy. As you can see in this diagram, there are a whole bunch of activities we do in a given year in HL7 and in da the DaVinci project, whether they be balloting our guides so that we can get the public comment and uh, see how we can improve the guides. We have connect-a-thons where we go and we bring the implementer community to test the guides. We participate in uh, public events and we just continue to do the work of improving the guides and, and supporting the implementer community. But really these guides aren't useful unless they meet some real world challenge and uh, can demonstrate value. So uh, we have a few sections that I'll highlight. This first section is really around quality and how we can improve 
uh, on quality. And so here in this area, we want to highlight two guides. And for a number of these guides, I'll be mentioning them in more than one section. But here we have the data exchange for quality measure and the member attribution list guide. And the idea here with the DEQM or data exchange for quality measure guide is really recognizing that um, the recording and reporting and um, exchanging quality data can be very challenging. And we have developed this guide that brings together the other aspects of FHIR, including clinical quality language and a set of profiles called QI Core that will allow us to represent quality measures in FHIR as a FHIR artifact and use those artifacts with this DEQM framework to collect data uh, on quality measures, put them together, do the calculations, and send reports. And where the data or the quality measure is very highly structured, we can do that uh, fairly programmatically with uh, minimal human intervention. We recognize that there are other quality measures that require review of records to, to meet the criteria, but by using uh, CQL and FHIR data and this FHIR paradigm, uh, we can define those quality measures and hopefully reduce the burden significantly on um, both the uh, providers and payers who have to report these quality measures uh, for regulators and, and, and others. And this work in DEQM really builds upon work that's already been done in the electronic uh, clinical quality measures uh, framework. So we're moving that framework into a FHIR approach. And we have tested this very extensively over the, uh, the past few years at Connectathons, and we have some uh, pilot work that's been done in the Pacific Northwest around this. And um, CMS has identified the DEQM uh, and the FHIR paradigm as part of their uh, long-term uh, roadmap that they published last year. So we're very um, optimistic that uh, quality measure reporting will be uh, much improved uh, using FHIR. As part of that, reporting on quality measures is great, and it's really important for us to know how we're doing, but often those reports, and historically, they've been very delayed. Getting a report on how I, uh, I uh, performed six months after the reporting period isn't so helpful. And so as part of this guide, we've also implemented a gaps in care functionality where we could actually create the same kinds of quality measure reports, but project them forward. So I might ask for this, these patients I'm responsible for, what are the uh, gaps that exist today in their quality measures? And what are the gaps that might exist a month from now? And the value that would be for me to be able to engage uh, my patients uh, earlier and improve my uh, care delivery as well as my uh, scores in quality measures. So um, keep an eye on this work. Uh, we're continuing to uh, mature it and, and do extensive testing with uh, groups like NCQA and uh, CMS to uh, continue this work. Additionally, we've been able to uh, combine the quality work with a member attribution implementation guide. So the first iteration of this uh, guide was to um, provide a mechanism for a payer and a provider to share an attribution list. We know that the, that list is really important to determine how you do performance metrics, how do you do um, quality measures, any number of things. And we know from our provider members that they have offices of individuals who spend their days managing these lists because uh, patients may come on and off these lists based on, on their coverage. And so this uh, implementation guide allows us to establish a list, um, know the details of uh, the insurance coverage on that list, and then curate that list and be able to exchange it between payers and providers so that we can keep that list uh, up to date. And by having an up-to-date list, it can be used for other activities like population management or other kinds of reporting. And so this first version of the, of the guide that's been published uh, and implemented um, really focuses on that initial list. And then we are planning to go back to ballot um, this January for the mechanism to update that list. And where that's gonna be important is that that allows us to use uh, the patient list beyond just risk-based contracts. Anywhere you use a patient list, 
we are asking folks to look at this implementation guide to see if it um, can support the needs of your patient list. And we're trying to do that across uh, uh, the Da Vinci use cases so that we have a consistent way of, of uh, um, exchanging uh, patient lists. And that patient list will come up frequently uh, throughout the rest of this uh, discussion because it's an integral part of um, reporting as well as uh, value-based care. So, so this member attribution list also fits into the business challenge around improving the accuracy and the completeness of clinical administrative data. And so we have a couple of guides that uh, uh, focus on that. One is around risk adjustment. And the other that uh, we uh, wanna highlight is the clinical data exchange. And our risk adjustment guide uh, has gone through its first um, iteration, uh, the STU-1 or Standard for Trial Use Version 1, and it's been published. And it really has focused on how to report um, uh, risk adjustment and um, chronic conditions between payers and providers. It's primarily just focused on allowing uh, pro uh, providers to know that for a given set of patients, the payer has identified either chronic uh, conditions or potentially emerging conditions that should be addressed. And uh, by working together, the, uh, the payers and providers can make sure that uh, all the patient's uh, conditions are appropriately addressed and to make sure that um, the information is complete in addressing those conditions. Along with that, uh, we have developed and have just finished validating a, a, an update to our clinical data exchange uh, implementation guide. Clinical data is exchanged extensively in healthcare uh, from uh, providing clinician to clinician referrals to uh, attaching uh, clinical information to claims and from uh, requests by payers for additional clinical data to support post-payment review. So we developed this clinical data exchange to support all three of those uh, situations. And it has really um, two major approaches to doing that. One is a direct query. So it uses fire out of the box, uh, which means if I can create a fire query and I have the right permissions uh, and authorization, I can go to a a fire endpoint such as an EHR and request that data. Now, in a payer provider relationship, there has to be a high trust relationship in which um, the parameters for doing these queries are, are uh, well defined between the payers and providers. And we have some evidence that that's already starting to happen uh, with a couple of our members where the uh, provider organizations are allowing um, their payer uh, partner to directly query uh, clinical data uh, for um, uh, supporting claims and, and, and other activities. But when um, we might not have that same level of uh, relationship, we ha have built in the ability to actually package up a request. Imagine a electronic version of a request for information, but that all those specific data elements are defined in FHIR and the, that can then be reviewed by the provider. And instead of having someone go out and gather that information, packages it up and send it back to the payer, we actually use FHIR to find all that information in, in the EHR, packages up, package it up and return it to the payer. So we're trying to minimize the burden of providers having to uh, um, find information to fulfill uh, information requests from um, payers. So this clinical data exchange um, is really gonna be an important part of that and can also support when uh, patients are being uh, referred to other providers. Imagine uh, if we were to be able to develop templates of information so that when a patient is referred to a, a specialist like a cardiologist for heart failure, we could identify that collection of data that a cardiologist would commonly uh, want and package that up so that it can be sent and be available uh, to the cardiologist when they do their first uh, visit and thereby avoiding the delay of having to gather information um, and um, have the information available to make a, you know, a complete uh, clinical assessment as well as planning. Uh, in addition, we know that the processes like uh, um, risk adjustment, quality and burden reduction, we have specific guides for them, but they may not have all the information upfront. And so this clinical data exchange is a bit of a, a Swiss army knife that will allow payers and providers to send more 
and more specific information uh, when it's necessary for these other programs. We've also um, added the ability to link um, the attachments with uh, claims, as well as uh, adding digital signatures to make sure we uh, cover things like uh, provenance. So um, this is just uh, a simple diagram to show that we have built into the guide the ability to do both uh, solicited attachments as well as unsolicited attachments. And a, a simple clinical example might be that a, a payer um, who has a patient being seen for a high-risk pregnancy, uh, they often want to monitor the, the patient's progress through their pregnancy and so have asked the uh, uh, OBGYNs to send uh, that information around the high-risk pregnancy along with their their claim so that they can uh, do that monitoring. So this guide allows us to do that attachments uh, to the claims. So our, our next set of guides are actually a number of them that uh, you may have already seen that have been implemented in the uh, patient access API, uh, the payer data exchange, the formulary guide, the plan net guide, and, and a newer guide uh, called patient cost transparency. In this set of guides, uh, this one is primarily around the patient-directed APIs. We've combined the DaVinci uh, directory or plan net and the formulary, along with a combination of the Karen implementation guide for Blue Button, along with uh, DaVinci, to be able to have patients uh, obtain their both clinical information as well as claims information via a payer's um, patient access API or FHIR endpoint. And these guides, of course, would work both as member or patient facing as well as provider facing. And um, these guides are, are really important in that we are making what was formerly very difficult information for patients to find, to aggregate, to understand more readily available and computable uh, with the hope that with this information, they can be better informed and more engaged uh, in their care. Just to, to highlight a little bit uh, around the payer data exchange, one aspect of it is really uh, making this uh, the clinical data as well as this claims data, along with the Karen Blue Button uh, implementation guide, available via um, FHIR APIs either to the patient or um, when implemented, available to the uh, provider. So you can imagine a provider seeing a brand new patient who they may not have a lot of clinical information, the patient can only provide so much they could use this API and this guide to get what is available from the patient's payer who knows much about what uh, is happening with the patient's care across a number of other providers and being able to have that information uh, available for clinical decision-making. The PDEX guide uh, does even more. And in the patient access API uh, rule, there was a uh, component for payer to payer um, data exchange. That requirement was um, uh, paused. I don't think that's quite the right word. Uh, discretionary enforcement by CMS. And we're expecting some additional uh, guidance. Um, and during that time, we created a, um, a mechanism for using both the uh, OAuth or um, Smart on Fire approach to sharing uh, the information from old payers to new payers about a patient as well as uh, developing some server-to-server -server approaches that, uh, that will help um, expedite the exchange of information uh, between uh, one payer and another payer when uh, the patient asks for it, as well as laying the groundwork for the future uh, use of other technologies like UDAP for, uh, for data exchange. Uh, this is a pretty active area um, in our DaVinci work, and we uh, have some uh, Connectathons uh, coming up that we'll be uh, spending additional time um, supporting the implementer community in um, utilizing this OAuth, the MTLS, or uh, I'm not going to try to do the acronym, as well as UDAP. Uh, so we hope uh, if you're interested that you'll participate in the, uh, the Connectathon. Another area within the same category is our patient cost transparency. We know that this is a really active area of both discussion and work in the community. Uh, for those unfamiliar, this work stems from the um, some legislation in uh, 2020 uh, from the No Surprises Act. And what the No Surprises Act broadly was trying to address was the, um, the challenges patients face when they uh, have a service delivered and they've made 
reasonable attempts to try to make sure that the providers are in network and they have a sense of, of what their co-pays are. But months after the service is delivered, they get a, a, a bill from a provider who participated in their care, but turns out was not in network. And um, that's where the surprise comes. And often the, the charges were unexpected and were are not covered by the payer. So the idea here would be that patients, when they have a service um, scheduled, that they get assistance in identifying the uh, participants uh, who are gonna, the providers who are gonna participate in their care and can get a good faith estimate whether they be an uninsured patient or if they have insurance, those good faith estimates uh, would be um, processed by their uh, insurer and they would get a, a, a advanced explanation of benefits. So they have an idea uh, of um, who's gonna be in network, out of network and what those costs would be so that then they can have those conversations with their providers as well as their payers. Um, this has been, um, uh, a challenging effort given that uh, this is a uh, not a, a workflow that is uh, widely done. And so we have focused in DaVinci on the first aspect of this, was, which is really how do we get, assuming we can get a good faith estimate uh, assembled between all the uh, participants, um, we can then um, exchange it with the provider who would take that information. Uh, we have worked with uh, X12 and uh, X12 experts to do the mappings uh, from uh, fire to X12 data elements so that we can support the X12 payload and then be able to deliver that to the payer who would use that data to adjudicate these um, pseudo claims, pre-adjudication claims and uh, match them with the patient's um, coverage as well as their uh, deductibles and other you know, financial measures, and then be able to create that advanced explanation of benefits and be able to make that uh, AEOB available back to the patient uh, via a, a fire mechanism, or if they decide uh, they want to do another way that they would also um, have the information depending on how the, uh, the patient wants it. But we've also uh, come to agreement in the community that the providers would really benefit from having that same information that the patients have because um, the patients are going to ask them, um, you know, wh where did this charge come from? Who's this participant? And with the providers having that information, they can um, more effectively engage in those conversations uh, with their patients. So this is really the phase one uh, uh, aspect of what we're doing uh, with the patient cost transparency. And there are a number of other areas that uh, we are looking um, and potentially going to develop some guides for next year uh, to support other aspects of the No Surprises Act. Um, this is just a, a, a timeline of the work we've done. We've been working on it now uh, for a year. We have uh, balloted uh, the guide back in May and are currently uh, undergoing ballot reconciliation with the community to kind of address um, uh, comments and concerns that were uh, brought up, but we continue to do testing and looking at how we can uh, continue to improve our guides. Um, the next set of business challenges are around uh, prior authorization. Uh, this is significant because uh, many of you may be aware that uh, there is a, um, um, some regulatory activity uh, with CMS and OMB around uh, burden reduction. Uh, there was a, an NPRM um, uh, close to two years ago that, uh, that addressed uh, prior authorization and burden reduction. And we, um, we believe that, that many of these uh, same concepts will be uh, coming back in this uh, current regulatory activity. But um, the area around burden reduction that we are working on uh, in this section is really around prior authorization. So there are really three guides that are um, involved in this prior authorization work. And they're really uh, addressing three aspects of prior authorization. The first being, does this patient need prior authorization for this service and is it uh, a covered benefit? Second is, if it is a covered benefit or I'm required to document, what do I need to document and how can we reduce the burden of documenting um, the clinical information and then with this clinical information, how can I submit a prior authorization and have a more um, expedient 
uh, response from the, uh, the payer so that we don't delay care and we make sure that um, appropriate documentation is completed. So we've uh, developed three guides, our coverage requirements, discovery, documentation, templates and coverage rules and prior authorization support that address these three. They've been uh, tested very extensively and um, we are continuing to uh, do ballot reconciliation uh, to address some of the concerns of the community when we first balloted this uh, earlier this year. But really, we believe that these three guides uh, will be beneficial to all the stakeholders. Uh, we want patients to get more um, rapid approval for necessary treatments. Uh, they can then participate in their care. And we want to um, provide an opportunity for the patients to have this information, the providers having this information so that they can decide when um, something does require prior authorization, um, do they have all the information they need. Um, for burden reduction, I think this is a huge opportunity for providers. Um, each step of the process today for burden, uh, for prior authorization requires the provider or their staff to go look for information, whether it's in payer portals or in their EHR when they're gathering clinical information. We really believe that leveraging standardized data via FHIR and other technologies like Smart on FHIR and CQL, we can lower uh, that uh, burden for the provider in um, gathering and submitting this information. And by using um, FHIR technologies like CQL, we can also um, work with payers to define the data that they need instead of um, um, having it, they have to, providers having to look it up each time and filling out forms. We, we hope to automate the process uh, more and more. And with, for the payers, the benefit would be that they uh, can improve their relationship with their uh, providers, recognizing that uh, prior authorization is, is a pretty significant uh, burden for providers and, and along with that documentation, but that the payers will ultimately have better um, information to help with uh, adjudicating uh, prior authorization uh, requests. So there are a number of aspects that we think there will be improvements. Using standards, we wanna standardize these interactions across payers and providers so that if you're a provider using one EHR, uh, you, can, you can interact with multiple different uh, uh, payers and the payers can work with EHRs that are used across their various um, provider uh, organizations. We, we believe that we can improve uh, in the timeliness of authorizations and when data is highly structured, we could get to the point where we're having real-time authorizations. Uh, and doing it more real-time is really important because if patients don't have a, a plan for their service and they leave, there's a, a high risk for that service not getting delivered because it's just the the frustration or complexity of getting uh, prior authorization. So we wanna make sure that the right care is being delivered for the patient. In terms of workflow, we've actually spent a lot of time uh, working with the EHR vendors um, to make sure that the workflow for prior auth can uh, work within the provider's workflow and minimize that, that additional burden. And when um, we, when information isn't available in the EHR, that there is uh, a, a way for us to um, pause the prior off process in order to collect or order additional studies to, uh, to complete the documentation. So we're very cognizant of the importance of making the workflow um, uh, fit into the uh, provider and their office uh, workflows. We also recognize that uh, we need to maintain um, HIPAA and, and privacy. And one of the areas that uh, FHIR can really help is the documentation requests and the clinical data will be much more specific. Instead of asking for kind of the entire record, uh, payers can ask for very specific um, uh, lab observations or studies. And so that is um, beneficial because we're only sharing relevant data that is specific for this prior authorization. And then ultimately, we'd like to be able to have uh, providers be able to do everything within their own EHR or their revenue cycle systems. Today, many of them have to use portals, multiple portals, in order to submit and track 
um, the prior authorizations across the various payers. By standardizing this approach, we hope to lower that burden for the administrative staff um, and uh, make it easier for them to monitor the, uh, the uh, prior authorization process. And because uh, this is a, a really important topic, I wanted to uh, share this slide, which really shows that we have a large number of the Da Vinci members who have identified these three guides as either um, part of their roadmap, their plans for next year, and just yesterday announced by um, Regents, Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and MultiCare that they've actually implemented these three guides in production. Uh, they, uh, they actually implemented it a couple of weeks ago and, and put out a, a release that's in uh, health data management. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, I'd point you to that, um, that article. But uh, we want to provide you some assurance that these guides have been very extensively tested. And um, uh, we believe there's a continuing work to be done, uh, but that the framework uh, uh, is, is well tested. So pivoting a little bit, uh, we've also started just this past month, uh, a new use case around value-based uh, performance reporting. Uh, when we started DaVinci uh, many years ago, uh, we talked about th these, this transition from fee-for-service into value-based care and how that transition is going to take, take some time. And over the past five years, we developed a number of guides that initially were very much focused on the kind of fee-for-service, fee but we know can also support uh, the value-based care journey. And so this year, we brought a number of leaders in the Da Vinci community to look at the value-based care journey so that we could um, get to a point where we could say, these are the, the, the milestones or the phases that we as a community um, feel are common across this concept of uh, a value-based care uh, relationship. So we have establishing the relationship, onboarding and establishing the infrastructure for performing on the, the contract. And then we needed a, a way of doing measurement and reporting, and finally uh, reconciling pavements uh, based on those performances. And what we were able to identify was that we already had a number of guides that support this, whether it be the attribution guide, uh, the exchange of um, quality measure data or risk data, uh, and a method for exchanging uh, clinical data out of band, like I demonstrated or, or talked about with the clinical data exchange. What we were missing was a method of uh, reporting uh, performance. Uh, providers today, we're told, are getting these reports in Excel files, sometimes as PDF, but often um, they have to do much more additional work to try to reconcile what's in the report to what information they have so that they can validate that the report was accurate. That's uh, time consuming. And if they have to do it across multiple payers and multiple formats, it's very burdensome for the uh, provider uh, staff. So we initiated this uh, use case to try to standardize that reporting, much in the way that we looked and have been able to standardize that risk adjustment reporting and the quality measure reporting. We want to leverage that work in the um, uh, value-based performance um, reporting implementation guide. And by way of metaphor, what I would envision is something similar to what happens in, in finance today. Corporations um, every quarter uh, do their quarterly reports and they have some industry standards on what they, how they report their performance. And the analysts uh, that, that review those reports can compare one corporation in, in a particular uh, sector with another corporation. And that allows them, um, they, they're provided similar or almost the same types of reports. And I think we can uh, achieve this in healthcare if we can start to standardize how we do this, this reporting. What's important is that we are, we're standardizing the reporting framework. We recognize that payer and providers based on their contracts may select different um, um, quality measures or different other metrics. But when it comes to ultimately uh, sharing those performance, uh, we wanna standardize that. And so uh, we're just in the early stages of uh, this work, um, developing this uh, STU-1, or first version, and we're really looking at just the report itself. Ultimately, uh, in future versions, we want to be able to 
look at how do you do contract settlement calculations or even sharing um, member level data so that um, the, it, the reports can be more actionable. But for the first version of this, we really wanna focus on the aggregate uh, reports uh, for uh, performance. So with that, uh, as always, uh, our ask to the community is to come join us. Uh, we need your subject matter expertise and your experience. And so we invite you to um, check out our uh, DaVinci um, Confluence page. That's part of the HL7 uh, Confluence site. Uh, if you go to confluence.hl7.org, you'll be able to find a link to the DaVinci um, sub pages on the right-hand side and uh, be able to find our use cases as well as a dashboard that shows all of these guides uh, that I've presented as well as links to their implementation guides, reference implementation, use case calls, uh, and uh, a myriad of other inf information. Um, we're also uh, active in um, working on the various responses to um, RFIs. We participated in the ONC's uh, response to the electronic prior off uh, RFI uh, earlier this year. Uh, we're working with HL7 to try to advance uh, uh, interoperability by uh, supporting X12 data. And uh, as many of you are probably aware, uh, we have a couple of recent RFIs around patient cost transparency and um, uh, CMS's uh, RFI on national directories. So uh, we're working on our um, analysis and response to those RFIs as well. So if you're interested in finding out more information about um, DaVinci, we have a community roundtable once a month. Um, the next one is uh, next week where we bring um, our members in to highlight and showcase the work they've done implementing our guides. Uh, we give you updates and just have an opportunity to uh, keep you informed about uh, what we're doing. So you can find more information about uh, that uh, roundtable on our DaVinci website, as well as recordings of our previous uh, community presentation. So we uh, have some, uh, on all these IGs actually, uh, one or more of our members have, have uh, talked about. And then we of course invite you to uh, participate in uh, the January um, Connectathon. And we have a couple of groups already um, prepping for that Connectathon around that payer to payer uh, data exchange. And we have a dozen or so DaVinci calls uh, a week um, that uh, are ranging from calls where we're developing the implementation guides to others where we're reconciling our validated guides to calls where uh, we're just helping the implementer community to um, um, understand our guides and implementers can come and, and, and ask questions. So uh, we invite you to uh, join those calls and, and um, learn more about what we're doing and in, engage in our, our standards and implementation work. And with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for your uh, support and your engagement in the, the work of HL7, as well as our uh, accelerators and uh, DaVinci. I think we have fantastic. time for a couple of questions. Great, uh, fantastic presentation. We, we have some questions. Um, a simple one uh, from, from Don, but an important one. Uh, we know the last word in, in fire is resources. Uh, can you explain the difference between an artifact and a resource? Yes, so uh, you, you all know I'm a terminologist. So I use the word artifact very broadly as just um, items that we use in the standards process. A resource is uh, what FHIR calls if, uh, their models. So if you, um, FHIR has a FHIR resource that is the model by which we represent a patient or an organization or a, a, a condition or a drug. And so if you were to go to hl7.org slash fire, um, you'll see the homepage. There's a link to uh, resources at the top. And if you click on, you'll see a, there's about 100, 120 fire resources. And that's the, the, the model by which we actually exchange an instance of the resource. So we have a model for a patient, um, for patient data. And then we have the instance of the patient data that, that matches that model. And then just one more addition is that we have profiles, which are specializations of those fire resources and uh, important uh, profiles for this community is really the US core profile that represents how we expect um, um, certain data such as 
uh, medications, observations, patient uh, are shared uh, using fire in the US realm. Excellent. Uh, Amal asks um, about TEFCA because as we all saw, the, um, they didn't name fire um, as the standard, but it they did put it on a roadmap. And, and can you talk a little about how CDEX will be incorporated or what, what we expect to see incorporated into TEFCA? Uh, I, that, that might be better for the RCEs, but I would yeah. when we get to a um, health IT ecosystem uh, of the future that that roadmap kind of starts to, to lay out, uh, the hope would be that the combining things like directory, security, message headers, we can support the stakeholder community, whether it be a provider or payer, to identify to what organization they want to send a record, make sure that that record, that location, that endpoint is an authorized endpoint, and to be able to use the FHIR APIs to connect to that endpoint and to do the exchange. So today, when you go to do travel and you use one of the travel uh, platforms, you're not so worried about the endpoints for the various airlines, but the platform needs to know how to direct you to the right airline or where they're drawing information from those airlines or other vendors. So in terms of uh, TEFCA, it's ultimately our, our road to a, an entire kind of interoperable ecosystem that uses existing and future standards and uses fire APIs and, and resources that define some of these specific workflows. Gotcha. Um, you, uh, you mentioned price transparency. I think uh, you know, it's a, a subject very uh, close to the hearts to, of a lot of folks. Um, you've talked about the um, the exchange between the provider uh, between the provider and the payer uh, to support the AEOB. There's that other component which is provider to uh, provider, so the GFEs can be collected uh, by the convener. Um, is is that on the Da Vinci roadmap as well? Um, yes, it is on the roadmap, and I think where um, I've mentioned this in, 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 in past calls, when it comes to standards, it's much easier for us to develop standards from a technical standpoint when there are well-established workflows. And I think one of the challenges we have today is that much of the coordination of providers in participating in, in a service for a patient is a human process and it varies from organization to organization, and that it all comes together when the patient shows up for their service, whether it's a surgery or a study, and that all that coordination is done in advance. The challenge I think is to figure out the best approach to move that coordination more upstream to when the patient uh, uh, wants to schedule that service so that we can uh, identify the providers um, and get get them coordinated in order to put together that GFE. Um, there's still lots of conversations about what's the best way to do that, that, that tries to re, uh, meet the needs of the No Surprises Act while not being overly burdensome to the, uh, any of the stakeholders. Well said, that's exactly, I think, uh, the position that uh, many of us feel uh, and we're trying to convey to the government as well. So, so with that, uh, Dr. Nguyen, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, I did want to reiterate that we are holding our member position advisory session November 9th from 12 to 4. It'll be an opportunity for you uh, to share your thoughts and perspectives on the X12 uh, standards proposed to NCVHS and the new uh, and updated operating rules proposed to NCVHS from uh, CAQH Core. So with that, I will um, close the event. Thank you so much. Uh, join us on Thursday for our discussion with NCPDP. Again, thank, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again.